Hey YouTube, what's going on? This is Joachim Comic Center and this is another segment of Finding Fandom and yeah, I'm just trying to make a little more of an intro because I recently discovered that you can pre-record your live streams and that is very helpful for, for me that has control issues with scheduling videos and everything so I'm going that route and yeah if there are any guests that you would like me to interview and that you feel have a new fresh view on collecting or maybe they make certain type of comic book videos hit me up in the comment section let me know and yeah in this edition we are gonna meet none other than BJ Kicks and also in the background we are joined by his newborn child Faith and I had a really great time talking to BJ and his channel he one of the most hardworking channels and has grown immensely during these last few months even with a move on the way which we are gonna talk about on this um, pre-recorded live stream and we're go also gonna talk about moving the collection and everything and how we experienced that amongst other things talking about his channel and what he loves with this comic book fandom so thanks so much for clicking on this video i hope you will enjoy hey everyone this is Joachim Comic Center, and this is yet another live stream session, but we're actually pre-recording this, as this gentleman just has, has taught me that you can do. So, why don't you present yourself? Sure. Um, so, what's up, guys? I am BJ Kicks. Um, <laughs> I buy comics, I read them, and I review them, all for your viewing pleasure. Yeah, and... I found BJ Kicks through, of course, one of his videos. I think uh, one of the videos that I actually saw first was a video special on Black History Month and comics that could associate to that. Mm. And later on, a very intriguing video on how to up your numbers a bit on YouTube. Oh, cool. It's always interesting like hearing like how people find out about you um yeah. you, just, you just never know like if if like my assumption would have been that someone just like shared it with you but you're like oh i just found this video i'm like that's cool that's really cool yeah i mean i, I don't really scavenge hunt as much as i used to finding mm -hmm. inspiration and everything for what comic books to buy and everything because that's usually the route it goes to finding people that has several titles in common with you mm -hmm. and then maybe they'll pick up one new titles that you never heard of but you feel that you have so much in common that you'll pick up that too and maybe find something new you'll enjoy right yeah so a little less of that now and now i'm trying to find people that actually make videos that sort of stand out from that from haul videos and collection videos and actually mm -hmm. try to make some original content which i felt that those were thanks man i appreciate that yeah it's it's hard because YouTube, because <laughs> YouTube definitely favors um, certain types of videos in the algorithm, like haul videos perform well, collection videos perform well. Um, the stuff I like doing most are like reviews and those tend to perform the worst. Um, so it's always a challenge trying to create compelling content, content that, you know, it, it's interesting, it's insightful and, and people will want to watch over and over again. Um, and balancing that with, you know, getting people to watch once at least. Yeah. And to quote a mutual friend of ours, uh, yeah. Marcus from Mad Dog Comics, we have our growers and our showers. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. And with those words, meaning that we have those videos that are the whole videos of the graphic novel collections, the whole videos, maybe the last pop in popularity for a week. Mm -hmm. when those books and titles still are fresh and the graphic novel collections maybe they have a little longer date when they're being popular i mean 
maybe throughout the year of that update. Yeah. And then we have our review videos, which truly are our growers that people will go back into as interest comes in on those yeah. titles. Yeah. Like, you know, you never know something, you know, Invincible's got that animated series. So if you had done a review on Invincible before, like all of a sudden you got a ton of traffic. Um, I did a review of a graphic adaptation of the Bible. And oh. I've noticed that that video was one of the first videos I did on the channel or not really one of the first, one of the earlier videos. And I've noticed that that video now has over 3000 views. Like people are constantly searching for that Bible. And when they do, they find my video. Um, and it's one of those things that like no one talks about, no one really brings it up to me. So I didn't realize it was performing as well as it was, but over time it's just growing and growing. Yeah. Because those books also, I have seen them around, but they are rare. Yeah. And I, I was intrigued for a while where I, when I was still hunting, but you know, several other titles got in the way and then you sort of forget because there's so much, right? so much and uh, also I, I think i have a s similar occasion where my overview of the two sandman omnibus mm -hmm. are are like my most popular video i have i think wow and nice. and that is basically because of sandman of course but then also i think there has to be something about it becoming a TV show and a radio show, I think. Right. Yeah. I think we got a podcast series on it now. Uh, exactly. Exactly. And then there's also, I mean, the comparison of people trying to figure out if they want to buy into the absolute or the omnibus, if they're going for a bigger format, that is. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, just a simple generic question. Just <sighs> okay. what made you get into comic books in the first place? um the short answer is my daughter so um i have an 11 year old well she'll be 11 next week my my daughter um and she loves art like she loves she'll draw she loves to paint um she sculpts she'll like she makes these shadow boxes with like just bits of cardboard that we throw away from amazon like she's kind of she just loves to make things and i noticed that in her i mean she's always liked it um, but, you know, two years ago, yeah, 2019, I was like, you know what, I used to read a lot of comic books, and I, I wasn't really reading the comic books, I would get them as a kid, just to try to copy the pictures out of them. Um, and so I was like, well, maybe she'll like doing that. And um, I just happened to see a Facebook ad for free comic book day at Ultimate Comics Raleigh. And so I was like, okay, well, I'll take her to that. And we made it a whole day, because that day also happened to be May the 4th. And so we went to the comic shop, we, we waited in the line, we got a bunch of free books. Um, and then later on that afternoon, we went to a minor league baseball game where all the team had Star Wars uh, inspired jerseys on them. So they had like Yoda on the back. It was really cool. Um, oh, that's great. But yeah, that day is what got me into comics. There was like a local artist who was doing like commissions on sketch covers. Um, there was a sculptor there and they had opened up like an extra storefront um, and they had a bunch of dollar bins. And so I went through and I was like just buying a bunch of random dollar books. I got like a, like nothing that I would really read today because they were like so random, the yeah. issues were. But um, yeah, I bought a bunch of stuff that day. And then they did a live show maybe a week or so after. And um, I bought a few things there and I won a copy of um, House of X number one. And Nice. Yeah, and it was like it was like one of those hidden gems variants. It was like a one in one hundred or something like that. Oh, nice! And so, well, I knew that one must have been valuable, so I went back to the store to buy a different copy that I could actually read. Um, and they're like, "Oh, do you want to subscribe to the series?" And I was like, "Sure." So that means I have to go to the shop every week to pick up the new issue, and I've been going to the shops every week since then. Do you still have that variant? I do. It's in a box though. Yeah, and you, you don't have to bring it, but I was yeah. just cu curious if, I mean, because whether if you're sell it or not, it'll be a memory for life. I mean, this is where it kind of started. Yeah, no, I'm definitely not selling. I won, I won House of X number one and then uh, the Marvel's epilogue sketch variant, both of those. Um, but yeah, I, I would never sell them. 
Do you have a pull list right now? I do. I have a pull list and it is um, funny enough. Here it is right here. I'm actually working on cutting down my pull list because I have a, I have a, my goal is to spend only $200 a month on comics. Um, and that's separate from like graphic novels and omnibus and stuff, but single issues, my budget is $50 a week. And the last two weeks, it's been nearly a hundred dollars and sometimes more. And so I just printed out my pull list and there are 81 active titles on my pull list. Ooh. And, you know, some series come out, you know, bi-monthly or monthly, exactly. and, but still there are way too many books on my pull list. And actually one of the videos I'm working on right now is me cutting this pull list in half. Interesting. The, you know, because if you, you've checked out my channel and mm -hmm. pe people that has checked out my videos knows that I'm all for just trying to get the most out of it. Mm -hmm. but maybe squeezing out the best of your collection. And that means that you'll, you'll have to, of course, read your books. So, right. you, so you know that what your taste actually is like and what you like and what maybe isn't for you. So finding those artists that you love and the writers that can't do anything wrong, in your opinion. Yeah. And... By that, we have an easier time to actually let go of some stuff that, sure, very good, but they're not great. Yeah. And I mean, because with myself, I just try to, you know, reach that high more often by not having so much, in my opinion, mediocrity within my own collection. Then we have different opinions on all the writing but it's all oneself's journey of course mm -hmm. so, so the titles itself doesn't matter but just trying to get the most out of it by you know there's so much <laughs> yeah yeah and and yeah so just trying to get the best out of it by knowing what you like and it's, i think that's exactly what you're going to go through now with your list exactly it's it's difficult battling like the fomo right? The fear of missing out, yeah. There's, especially when it comes to single issues. Well, I can't, it's collected editions too, you know, because you know, it's going to go out of print if it's a collected edition. Like if there's only so many that are going to be printed and you might end up really wanting a story or you might hear great things about the story, but you won't hear those things until the book is sold out in a lot of cases. Yeah. Um, and it's the same way with single issues, except with single issues, there's also the, the, the speculator market where, you know, a story might be great, but if it has the first appearance of some new character or something significant happens, then all of a sudden a bunch of people who may not even be reading comics yeah. will just go to the stores, they'll swarm the stores and, and grab, grab it off the shelves. And now you can't get that book. Um, and so that didn't really bother me before because I don't sell any of my books. Yeah. Um, but especially now, since I've started a YouTube channel, one of my goals is to find new stories and highlight the ones that are good. And so I find myself like taking chances on series um, a lot more. And then with that, I also tend to be a completist. So if I buy issue one of a four issue miniseries, I'm automatically buying issues two, three, and four as well. Yeah. Um, but that's where it kind of gets crazy because it's like, okay, well, you own, and you, you even made a video about this, right? You only have so much time in a day, yeah. right? Like, even if I had an unlimited amount of space and I could store all of my books beautifully and have them well organized, I still only have 24 hours in a day and I have other obligations, right? I have my wife, I have two daughters and one of them is a newborn right who needs care like around the clock um and so it's like at a certain point you're buying comics faster than you can read them yeah and i mean i'm i'm today is saturday so it's my cleaning and organizing day and um i just found i was organizing my milestone media comics and i, oh, found I saw that update i saw oh, that cool. thanks man but yeah I, and then so I just grabbed a short box off the shelf, like, wait, what's in here? And what was in there was the entire month of June's comic releases. 
Oh, from that time. Uh, well, May and part of May and part of June. But they you read them? That, no, they were still in the bags. Now I remember I was organizing books a couple of um, a few days ago, and I noticed I had issue. 79 and issue 81 and i'm like where's issue 80 that's weird um that's where it was in that yep. box but it's because i was moving right we were moving yeah um our daughter was in the hospital so we were just very busy so there was a about a month long where and you can tell on my channel there's about a month long period where i wasn't really reading anything um and so the only thing that was coming out on the channel was hey here's an unboxing real quick just to have something to throw out there um, but yeah, so now I'm getting to the point where, okay, we're finally moved in, we're finally settled and I want to clear this backlog and I'm looking and I'm like, okay, there's way too much here. Like, so what I'll be doing with this pull list video is I'm going to be going through all the series that I have and kind of, I'll be reading through the backlog and then saying, okay, do I want to continue this or not? And I'll have to be okay with ending a series you know, like if, if Amazing Spider-Man is not good up until issue 71, I need to be okay not buying issues 72 through 74 to complete the run. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's going to be a challenge, but we got to do the, it. The only way, uh, and I'm going to talk about a little bit how I got out of a single issue game also, just going to mention it. But the only way you're going to be able to walk away from a title like The Amazing Spider-Man or Batman Mm-hmm is to find your own ending. Mm. They are never gonna make a final issue of those characters ever. I mean, there's gonna be Elseworlds tales. Yeah. I mean, some some would argue that The Dark Knight Returns is the final Batman tale. Yeah. But that's an Elseworld. And my, in my self perspective, uh, or in my view, I think that issue number 801 of the Amazing Spider-Man, that's, that's my final Amazing Spider-Man issue. Until they publish an omnibus of Nick Spencer's, I might check that out. But, mm -hmm. I mean, what Dan Slott did with that run, he wrapped it up so nicely, and I had this huge marathon of it. So I really appreciated what he did in the end. And uh, speaking about single issues, because, of course, I've also had a pull list, I was pulling like the Amazing Spider-Man, Detective Comics, Batman, and then uh, Batgirl came in at some point, the Gail Simone run, and some other miniseries that went on during the New 52. Mm -hmm. I didn't, uh, during the rebirth, I think I just concentrated on Batman books, actually. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I noticed was getting easier because you still collected the collected editions and, and so forth. So I got more time because when I moved away, I moved away from my comic shop and everything. So I just uh, went cold turkey and cut the whole pull list. Mm. I got, so now instead of reading like six to 10 single issues, I got one more trade or mini hardcover read instead yeah. for the time that that would have taken up. And the other fear you have with letting go of single issues, I mean you're not cutting all of your single issues, but one of them could be spoilers or potential spoilers for what is current. Yeah. But that has also to do with what are your sources and everything? Where does your eye look? Instagram, Facebook, or other YouTube channels that might spoil something. I mean, you can filter that out. And if it's your own attention that you're afraid of, that you'll just, oh, but I still want to know what's going to happen with Batman or Spider-Man next month. Mm -hmm. You'll you'll get away from that by you're, because you're too busy reading the books that you already have and the collected editions that you still buy in. So it's just redirecting your attention, basically. Yeah, you know, I'm still... The other thing is with... Yeah, the, the biggest issue is spoilers, I think. That's that's one of the... Well, that's a big concern, spoilers. The other is I just love my comic shop, right? And I think it was, you said it was easier for you because you moved away from your shop. If I was in an area where there wasn't, you know, an LCS or if my LCS wasn't as good as it is, right? Um, like 
I feel like we're like a little family, right? Like the, if you yeah. go on a certain day of the week, you know who's going to be there when you get there. You have great conversation. Um, you know, the, the owners of my LCS, they set aside titles for me um, to check out. Um, if they know a book is getting hot, they'll reserve it for me just to make sure I get my copy. Um, and they're great people. But I mean, I can literally go to the comic shop any day of the week and just sit there for an hour talking to people um, about the comics and stuff like that. Um, so I love that experience. And that's one thing I don't want to give up um, yeah. going the collected editions route, even though, you know, at this point, because I'm so behind on my pull list, it's like, by the time I read the story, the trade is out anyway. So it's like, I might as well just, you know, trade weight. That's um, also a good point. And I mean, still, if you would cut your pull list, I mean, in half, or if it would be gone, I think you would still be just as welcome, of course. I mean, you've yeah. been a customer for years now. Mm -hmm. And I mean, at some point you have to look, I mean, f further ahead than just be high. I'm here to have a great conversation and you'll know you'll have it because I'm going to buy something from you. I mean, right. at some point, I think they can look past that. Yeah. And well, the other thing is if I decide to, you know, cut down my single issues, right. It's not because it's not just a budget thing. It really is a space and time thing. Um, yeah. Then I feel like I can make up for what I'm spending there by buying more collected editions, which are more profitable for the shop anyway. And I'll just pay, you know, retail at the shop and i figured that's how i would do it if i was going to make that switch but um i there is still something that i love about the the weekly format and reading the newest thing this week but i've got to get back to a space where my list is manageable so that by the time wednesday comes i will have already read all of my books and i can say i'm excited because this is coming out um and i was i was very good at that up until um pretty much my wife's pregnancy and then i started the youtube channel once i started the youtube channel that's when i fell behind on reading um and so maybe that's the balance too maybe it's just okay i'll yeah. make less videos i have more time to read yeah and i'm actually having a video preparing for that also but it's gonna be further ahead i think mm -hmm. about one month from now but i'm actually gonna make a video about hobbies and priorities and what actually gets done yeah because i myself i mean i have more hobbies than just comic books and some of them i still practiced some of them i've completely neglected mm -hmm. for the last year a couple of years and uh, yeah i just wanted to go through what i was thinking about that and right. what actually gets done and yeah I, just like any video i just make them because i, I i'm thinking that I can't be the only one. Right, yeah, comics definitely took over my life. Um, <laughs> one hobby that I had in the past was music production. Um, now, to be fair, what kind of killed the music production hobby was having a family and having to be conscious of like how loud I'm being and things like that. We were living in an apartment. Um, and then for the last year, up until last month, we were living with family members, um, trying to save up for a house. So now that we're in our own space, I can get back into music production. But now the issue is time because I filled the time that I had for that hobby with comics and YouTube. And there are, I love each of those things for different reasons. And so, yeah, prioritizing that. I'm sure that's going to be, I'm, I'm interested to see how you handle that. Yeah, I'm telling you, I'm not handling everything all too well, but I'm, I mean, uh, I used to play guitar a lot more. I used to play board games when I was younger. And uh, I mean, not like uh, role playing board games, but mm -hmm. you know, like traditional chess or oh, yeah. go. And just if you want to get better at those things, you kind of have to be just as obsessed with that as you are with comic books, you know? Yeah, that's that's how especially with music. It's like if you stop playing for a certain amount of time you know you don't have the calluses on your fingers anymore or maybe you haven't like you don't have the dexterity so you can't reach the certain frets and you don't have the coordination that like it's it's like playing a sport like you have to keep practicing and using those things absolutely it, i mean it's a it's a muscle like anything if if nothing else a muscle memory 
Yeah, exactly. So we had actually gone through a few questions that I was just still gonna ask you, but I mean, this has gone through so fluently now. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna check which questions uh, that I've basically gotten answered and if I can bring up something new. Sure. Uh, when you were moving, because we, we talked about it, you clearly moved location. You're at a new house now, and you're going to be staying there at for a year, right? At least one year. At least um, one year. The housing market, I think in all over America right now, is just insane. So our original plan was to buy a house this year, but then my daughter was born prematurely in March. And so all of our time that we would have had to adjust because she wasn't due until June. Um, I see. So our plan was, okay, well, we'll try to get into a house before June um, and then we'll have, you know, three months off from work to get moved in and adjusted and, and so on. Well, my daughter was born early and we weren't quite ready to buy yet. Like we, there were a few things that just needed to get lined up. And by the time we got those things ready, um, the market had just exploded. Like people yeah. are paying 50 and 60,000 above asking price. They're buying homes sight unseen. So it was like, we would go and look at a house on Saturday and call them on Monday to make an offer. And they're like, sorry, it's already sold. Um, and so I didn't want to just rush into a house um, and not, and not love the house. <laughs> That's my baby. She's cool. But, um, yeah, I didn't want to just rush into a house that I didn't love. But um, yeah, so we decided to rent a house. And so we'll be here for at least a year, um, most likely two, though. Because um, now that we're here and we're making the space our own, I mean, like, I've decorated my comic room. Um, my wife has been doing a lot of work in the bedroom and the living room. And so now that we're here, we're like, huh, we like this space. And so we'll probably stay in it unless we can find an amazing deal on a home or, you know, if we have another child or something, we find like, we feel like we're outgrowing the space, then we'll move somewhere else. Yeah. And of course, all for it, for you to wait on what is probably one of the biggest purchases one makes in their lifetime. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We know when we buy a house, we want to like, our question is like, can we see ourselves living here for at least 10 years? And so, you know, our goal, I mean, we were going to buy a house with like a bunch of, a, a couple of extra rooms, um, but whatever, it's not, it's not a big deal right now. It's really, yeah. what's important to us now is just making sure our family's safe. We're in a nice area that, you know, a safe area and that we're together and we love each other and we're not cramped. So that's, that's all that matters. Right. Uh, when you moved, did you sell off anything? Because... In, in my experience, I sold off maybe half of my furniture and everything before I moved. So when we, uh, well, we were staying with family. Now, before we moved in with, um, you know, family members, we did sell off most of our furniture. Um, so when I moved this past, this last, like last month, the only things we really had to move, we had, um, we bought all new furniture when we moved in here. Um, the only thing I really moved was my comic collection all of our clothes um and then we had been buying furniture on the facebook marketplace and so we were keeping that stuff in a storage facility okay uh, so we moved the stuff out of storage um but yeah it was just we, we we trashed my old desk like if you guys saw the old videos you know there's like nothing from those videos that are in my videos now um so this room is like all brand new furniture um, and shelving and stuff like that. But no, I didn't sell off any books. And that's only because I didn't have time to. I actually have several boxes of books um, that are either going to be giveaway prizes or I'm going to list for sale. But I just haven't gotten around to it because we've been so busy. Yeah, but eventually, I mean, there's no stressing in that. Eventually, you'll get to those things. It's just time management, as you are, as I can tell, very aware of. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, but okay. So in the opposite spectrum, when you moved or if it was bef before when you moved to your family's house or when you moved into this new rental, uh, did you have to buy anything new except for furniture, anything that helped your, 
uh, moving experience. Um, yeah. So, and I did a whole, I did a series called moving my collection on the channel. Um, and that kind of led into the building, the comic room. Um, I did buy a bunch of short boxes, like a lot of short boxes. Um, and then I got a bunch of diamond boxes from my comic shop. Um, so, nice. so I found that the diamond boxes worked best for trades. Um, but the short boxes were better for single issues as well as the omnibus. Um, I know you were moving your omnis in like fruit boxes. Yeah. Was, yeah. I but, was the cheapest route you could ever go. Man, the, watching that video, I was just like so nervous. I'm like, maybe he's not moving far or, but I'm like, I would never, if I had books that I know had to be stacked or if I had to put them in a truck, then that wouldn't have been the way that I transported them. I got yeah, them to be covered. Um, but let's yeah. see, for, for my defense, mm -hmm. uh, let's see here. I work at a, a local retail store, which I then had access to about the first move when I moved from this place. It was about 40 boxes that I needed for my comic book collection because, and maybe even more because I had over 900 graphic novels at that time. Wow. And that's nothing to wow about, I think, right now because I've sold half of it, but I'm mm -hmm. double as happy with what I've got. Yeah. And it was a much nicer experience go walking down the stairs with the collection than walking up six stairs. I have to tell you that. Absolutely. And let's see here. So doubling down on the boxes, but I still kept those boxes when I was away for two years because I didn't want to uh, befriend the local <laughs> there as much yeah. as just, hey, can I get some boxes? I have some stuff that I have to move in a couple of years. Right. So I just kept them up in the attic storage space and pretty much nothing else. Yeah, And I still keep them now because uh, just like you, I don't know. I hope maybe for half a year or a year max, mm -hmm. I'll stay here and do the job that I have right now because of um, COVID and everything affecting the market, which I want to enter into with uh, producing 3D visualization pictures, renders mm -hmm. and whatnot. Because people are going to have to try to start up projects again. Yeah. So that's why I'm in this situation right now, but it's a good situation uh, when you compare it to what could have been, because I could have quit my job and I could have uh, said that I want to uh, move out of this apartment permanently instead of just renting it out secondhand. Mm -hmm. So then I, would be out of a place and a job, but so I'm in a good place for what has happened still. Yeah. 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 One thing I, it's, it's cool. You mentioned like just keeping the books in the attic. Um, I want the boxes curious, in the, the attic. Boxes, my bad, not the books. <laughs> um, but I'm curious to know, like, did you find that you had way more stuff when you moved? I mean, I know you said you sold a bunch of stuff off, but like one thing that surprised me was just, how much I had because when we moved in with family it was October 2019 and believe it or not I moved into that house with one short box of comic books um at the time the biggest collection I had was records I had about 1200 vinyl Ooh. albums Damn. Um, and those are super heavy I still have them but they're I mean that was moving those was brutal that's a but, whole nother collection video. Yeah, that's that's a so, that's a whole different thing. Um, I don't even they're not even in this room because they wouldn't fit. There's no way to display them. So um, but I've got them on hand. So if I decide to start making music really heavily again, I can I can use them. Um nice. but yeah, I moved here. I had one short box, and that short box held all my single issues and the two graphic novels that I had at the time. And now when I moved this time, we had I had twenty two uh, short boxes. Yeah, I saw. And that's just the single books, and then we've got all these omnis and stuff. And so I was very much amazed at how much I had amassed, and you know, not and I wasn't like proud, like oh, I got so much stuff. It was just like, oh my gosh, 
<laughs> what, what have I done? Yeah, yeah. It's like, what is, what is this? What is going on right now? Um, and that's another reason why I said, okay, well, I don't want to accumulate things at the rate that I have been in the past. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think this, the name of this series is great. Like finding fandom, like really discovering what you love and deciding to stick with that. Like it's super important. Yeah. And with that, it should be said that you should get 50% out of this because fandom was actually the name in the beginning. And then we met up at Near Mint Condition mm -hmm. uh, talking about Marble Solicits. And then in the aftershaft, you spurred the name Finding Fandom just oh. to give it a bit of a touch there. Yeah, that's I forgot about that. But I remember... Because you had a different project you were going to do with that. Yeah, time. and and that's still in the pipeline. Cool. Uh, cool. Making a video on how the pandemic uh, affected uh, the collected edition community, basically, mm -hmm. yeah. and the comic com book community itself. Because I have my point of view, which is, of course, as a minimalist, I maybe I don't possess as much uh, pop culture memorabilia and everything as I used to. And I'm not judging anyone else for having more, but I think maybe we got lost somewhere when we got, when we lose touch with our friends that we could meet up at Comic-Con and events such as that, or maybe even just talking, you know, friend to friend. Uh, we, we noticed that we, we have a lot more time on our hands because we're home and alone and can fill that up with books but no one is really thinking about the time that all those books will take up when you get back to work yeah and as i mentioned in that video about uh, time is money and all you have is books i mentioned the what if we had a timestamp of the average time it would take for the average reader to finish off a book yeah. just like it is with but more exact with a film or a TV series, if you would buy a box set of that, it would say the time it would take to yeah. finish it. Yeah. Would people really think twice about buying something if they saw how much time it would actually take of their hands? Because it's not just your money you pay for it, it's with your time. Yeah, I think so. Like, I know that I'm not big on TV shows, like on Netflix. Um, I know people people love to binge watch things, but if I go on Netflix and I'm like, oh, this series looks interesting, but I'm like, there's eight seasons. I'm immediately like, how long is it going to take me to watch this? I don't have time for that. It's funny because I never really applied that to books. And I guess it's because, you know, you feel like, oh, I've got all, I've got the rest of my life to read books, you know, they'll, they'll always be here and so on. But, you know, you do you really? Because there's always going to be something new. There's always going to be something else. There's always going to be something fresh, you know, so to speak. Exactly. Um, so that's an interesting balance to find. Yeah. And I have another video coming up about uh, minimalism and collecting and how it works for me. Mm -hmm. And the video might be up before this, actually. Oh, cool. So we'll just have to see. So if it's up, I'll send a link to it in the description and if it's not it's upcoming i guess nice it's so weird doing this pre-recorded stuff so yeah. you don't really know how it's ending up in the linear world yeah yeah um yeah I, it's funny because like and i i always forget the things that i mentioned in my videos like for example when i did my um my room tour i shouted you out and i was like i'll put a link in the description and somebody hit me up like, hey, I don't see a link. And I was like, oh, yeah, I did say that, didn't I? So, so I went and put the link to your, your channel. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank it's so, oh, no problem. So just so, thank you. <laughs> no problem at all. Um, because uh, if you guys didn't see that video, um, it absolutely was inspired by Joachim's apartment tour. Now, Joachim's video was still world's better. He's got the camera slider. He's got the fancy angles. I don't know, like you put your camera across the street and it started walking down the street. I don't trust people that much, so I can't do it. But yeah, but, um, yeah so like that video, it was just produced so well. And so my video, it's just me like, oh, hey guys, look, it's my room, right? And I was like, <laughs> I, don't wanna, I don't want that to be the video now that I've seen Yo Kim's. Um, 
Of course, I like messed up the camera. Angle. But yeah, uh, you're good. You're still good. <laughs> cool. But yes, yeah, so I was like, I, I want to do something a little bit. So I put the camera on the tripod. I tried to get like some steady shots, but my hands are, are the worst. Yeah, but, but you, you can still, if even if you do that shot, you know, you can slow down the track and everything while mm -hmm. editing it so it looks smoother, even though maybe it's kind of shaky. Right. So you can get away with it. And there's different types of homemade slides you can mm. create. I mean, I know you have a rug specifically in your comic book room, but otherwise you could put your tripod on a towel or something and just drag yeah. that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, there's a lot of different YouTube videos on that, I guess, on ho homemade sliders and whatnot yeah. for your camera. I think but they call that guerrilla filmmaking. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. thank you for your kind words. I did put a lot of effort into that video, actually making it um, three weeks too late to be published by my, I tried to do one video per week. Yeah. Moving, moving here, I felt that maybe every second week would do. And when it, it was time, I just wasn't ready. Yeah. And so I uh, begged for another week for my viewers and they said no problem and i still could have done so much more with that video i feel but i i'm also a firm believer that if you do not have a deadline you'll just procrastinate that until the end of time exactly that when i put my video out that's what i was saying like i i really felt like i could have recorded it one more time and gotten it a little bit better um but i was like you know what let's just get it out there you know people will like it or they won't and I can always do a different tour later. Exactly. And yeah, I mean, I liked your room also because I, I know what you were getting after. After, Of course, I tried to see what uh, my video inspired, but then I also saw, saw you in the video as well mm. with you showing off the artwork and everything and what you see when you just enter the room Mm -hmm. and what those means to you and why does this stand over here and this and so forth so the whole kind of system that you yeah. you made work for you so you made this room uh, to work for you so you can find everything where you need it so to not be looking all the time right right it's this room is smaller than I thought it was going to be. We didn't get a chance to like actually tour this home before we signed the papers on it. And so like there were, I had a whole different plan for the room. Like the wire shelves I thought were gonna fit in the closet and I was gonna have more like shelves um, for the Omnis and stuff like that. But I knew going into the room a few things. I don't want floor to ceiling books because it makes me feel like the walls are closing in. And oh. am I ever going to reach the top shelf anyway? <laughs> um, you know, I, so I, I, I didn't want floor to ceiling shelving. Um, and I, I wanted it to look clean. Like I know the word minimalist, like I think is overused because I wouldn't describe myself that way. You could right? call it simplified. Yeah, right. I want it to look clean. I want it to look modern. I don't want it to look cluttered. That's that's the exactly real thing, right. And so it's like I want everything. If something is out and on a shelf, or I can see it with my eyes, it needs to have a purpose. And that purpose may just be I like looking at it, but I don't want things to be haphazard. I don't want like right now. You can see the shelf right here is kind of my workbench as you as so to speak like those are the books that need to be bagged boarded and sorted and it's like okay so this shelf i'm allowing to look kind of you know not really chaotic it's still orderly yeah. um, and then right behind me that is the little nook where all of my books that are waiting to be unboxed sit until i unbox them so you but, have a system yeah but everything else in the room like i need the floor to be clear because my daughter might be in here crawling around um, and I also need the shelves to be stocked a certain way so that they can't tip over or anything like that. Um, but yeah, overall, I think that I was able to make the room work. The only thing that I'm really concerned about is there's not a lot of room to grow. Like I'm going to have to add another shelving unit somehow. 
Yeah. Um, so I got to figure out how I can do that without losing the vibe that I've created for the room. There's another word I was thinking that might fit, fit better than minimalism mm -hmm. because that word, it, there's so much stereotype into it and people think it's a certain default setting to it. Yeah. That it's a, this white room with just one chair, and a <laughs> vase, and maybe a painting. I don't know. Right. Um, but you know, uh, essentialism. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great word. Like keeping the things that are essential to you, that are just important to you. Yeah. It, it's the it's mini that people get hung up on and think mm -hmm. that it means I don't want to get rid of my stuff, but it's no. Keep your stuff and makes you happy and that you use and everything it's the overflow we want to get out right right like just essentials my, yeah in my closet there's books that i know i'm not gonna read whether they're duplicates or they're books that like i won from somewhere or something like that and it's like okay i need to get rid of that whether that's taking it to a library uh and donating to them whether it's taking it to a group of kids selling it online whatever I don't care if I make money from it, it needs to leave my house so that I have room for the things that I do love. And but at least you gain some space and some potential time that you exactly. maybe would have wasted it if you exactly. still didn't care about those books, reading them. Right. But yeah, and then the other thing with this room is it has to serve so many purposes. Yeah. Like I, I work, this is my home office that I do my day job from. Um, and then I do YouTube and I run two different YouTube channels. Uh, so one goal of the room was I needed the room to look good, no matter where a camera may be pointing in the room. I needed to look like, you know, decent at, at least. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, like you saw on the, the desk part, it's like, all right, well, I've got this open area on my desk. If I want to make music, yes. I can put my keyboard there. If I want to eat, I can put my food there, like all of that. Um, and so, yeah, versatility is probably the one word that I would use uh, when I'm describing the goal of the space and the key to that has been organization and that that's a constant battle. It's so hard to stay organized when you're always adding things to a space. Yeah. And that was my favorite part actually of your video using that B footage over that, uh, voiceover, just mm. showing different situations because it, it, I mean, you could put words, just saying it straight into the camera, but actually showing Mm. and make some storytelling out of it yeah. because we have a lot of comic book fans but we do not have a lot of video makers or lovers i guess that wants to show off a bit more of a cinematic feel yeah yeah that's true um but yeah i just i know i know that a lot of people that watch comics on youtube also our content creators or and or also just aspire to do other things um and so it's cool to have like the room where the comics have taken over your life but it's like i have to live with my comic books <laughs> you know i have to do other things and so i don't want the space to feel overwhelming um yeah. and, and so i wanted to show like hey here's how you can keep your things but also keep your sanity yeah exactly but so i had this question sure. laying around uh now, when we actually know that you're going to move eventually again, mm -hmm. would you uh, would you mind moving such a big collection that you have now again? Or would you downsize it first? Or do you feel that it still can grow even more and then move it? Just so, feeling that it is right now. Yeah, I know that my collection is going to grow more. Um I've gotten into collected editions a lot more than I was before. Before the Omnibus were like the one thing in the store that I would never look at. Um, but the pandemic changed all that because there were, you know, there were, we couldn't buy comic books, right? Yeah. The only, so co collected editions were the only thing that were still going in a lot of the time, um, or I might've been finding them on eBay or, or whatever. And so that's where I started buying collected editions. And now, I love the way they display. I love that format. And so I know as, and because I'm a new reader, you know, I'm, I've only been in comics two years, but comics have been coming out for like 78 years at least. Yeah. Like Batman is 80 years old. And so I know a lot of times the only way I'm going to get to read those stories is through the collected edition, unless I buy an iPad and go digital or something. 
Exactly. Um, so, so I know the collection is going to grow. Um, as far as moving it, this time I did it all myself. Like, even though we had like people that came and helped us move, I literally was like, hey, don't touch this room. I'll move this room myself on a separate day because I didn't want anything to get messed up. Yeah. I don't think that's sustainable. I don't think I'll be able to do that the next time around because I know the collection is going to grow. So yeah, there will be some downsizing. I mean, between now and then I plan to have read a lot of my stuff. The one thing that I, I, the one rule I have as far as collecting is I will buy everything Batman and everything X-Men. And so when it comes to selling things off, those books will almost always be safe. Everything else is fair play. So, you know, I may, I may sell off my Superman collection. I may sell my Jeff Johns Flash Omnis that I bought. It wasn't from you. I can't remember who I bought it from. So oh, it was definitely not from me because I saw my last night and <laughs> it would be a killer uh, cost to send it over to America. Exactly. Um, the person that I, I bought them from is, has a name similar to yours, but I can't remember what their name was. But um, yeah, so anyway, the but I but I know I have a lot of DC. I don't have a lot of Marvel, so I know I'll be buying a bunch of stuff. But yeah, anyway, I won't be moving it myself next time. Yeah. I'll, but I know I have to be mindful of how much I buy because when you're paying somebody to move, they're paying they're charging you based on how much it weighs and how difficult it'll be to move. Oh, I thought they just uh, took charge by the time it would take. Yeah, it's it's all that. Like they'll look at your stuff and they'll say, like, oh well, this is how much it'll cost to pack that. And it's it's a whole process. Um, the one thing that I, you know, am very comfortable doing myself is packing my collection. But um I'd probably I'd rather have some other some hands to help actually move it. But it's my my job to pack it securely so nothing can happen to it in transit. Yes. Uh and I forgot to mention this. Uh while we were still talking about I mean, uh, selling off stuff before moving and everything. Mm -hmm. And in my case, <laughs> I don't think I've mentioned this as much, but when I moved away from here first, two years ago, it took three trailers, uh, you know, that you hook up to your car Jeez. to move everything that I had. Mm -hmm. So uh, one trailer the first weekend, and then have to wait another week for two more cars with two more trailers yeah. to get the rest of the stuff so I can move in. And my dad told me that with, uh, let's see here, there, there I was standing with four full-size Billy shelves and, you know, one skinny Billy shelf. That's mm -hmm. five and a half shelves, we'll say. Yeah. He said that in two years, if you're going to move back, you'll only stand here with two sh Billy shelves. Otherwise, we're not helping. <laughs> oh man! I mean, I mean, I, I, I still think that he would have helped me move. Yeah. But I totally understand. Yeah. Why he put that ultimatum on me? Yeah. And, I mean, with a student loan and everything, I was going by the minimum wage that you can live by, mm -hmm. and if I still wanted to buy comics then of course I would have to sell off some stuff. Yeah. And that's that's part of the reason I still buy single issues because I don't have as hard of a time parting with the single issues. Like um, uh, my first appearance of Punchline, it's the one book I regret selling, but I sold that book for, I sold the first and second appearance of Punchline together for like $160. And with that money, I bought the out of print then uh mcfarlane spider-man omnibus and i was excited about that um and then they announced a reprint and then i was like yeah well, i'm done with this but you know you never know now but with the single issues it's like you know you can spend four or five dollars on a book and sell it for you know five times that and so i like that aspect of it but again my collective personality like i don't like selling things if I like them at all. And I don't like buying things if I don't think I'm going to like them. So it's a catch 22. Yeah. And I mean, the graphic novel collection was the very last thing that I charged with my minimalist 
uh, mindset mm -hmm. because I sold everything else that I felt wasn't essential and, and the graphic novels were still, you know, the best things ever. But then yeah. I realized that maybe there's some room here for yeah. other stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I sold off over 400 books wow. and later on, uh, also, uh, moving here with my girlfriend, mm -hmm. adding her stuff into the mix and then selling off the furniture that we didn't need, that we would upgrade for the room tour that you saw. Mm -hmm. We only had to move with two trailers nice. with her and her and my stuff now. Nice. So, so I sold a whole trailer worth of stuff in two years. Wow. It's um, it's funny. Like if you decide, if you go back and add up all the sales prices, you're probably like, "Wow, I that was a lot of money." Like, we have, uh, I mean, we have our own version of eBay here in Sweden called okay. Tradera, where I choose to sell off most of my Blu-rays and DVDs and comic books, graphic novels, and I can actually go back there and choose the dates going oh, yeah. back two years and up till now and i can see exactly how much i've sold for mm. then i might question myself where did all the, those money go but yeah. of course it's all going around and i i told day davis on omnination comics that i mean my collection with over 900 books it was self-sustaining by that time when i choose to sell off some stuff because it paid for itself going around yeah, that's one thing that I think is important. And I know a lot of collectors kind of turn their nose up at this concept, but um, having your hobby pay for itself, you know, having, you know, buy maybe maybe you do buy an extra issue of, you know, Batman or something like, and it's like okay, well, it's, I'll sell it later. Or, or, you know, not being afraid to part with your books. For me, YouTube, a part of YouTube for me was the motivation that I had a daughter coming and I didn't want to have to spend my comic money on diapers, you know? Yeah. So it's like, all right, well, if I have a YouTube channel and it does, you know, even semi well, that'll be like some revenue that I can then put back into the comic hobby, you know? So even if I have to downsize, I still have something coming in. Um, and, you know, I've been fortunate, you know, that it's kind of, it's led to sponsorships and, and different things like that. So, I mean, I, there are some things I don't have to pay for as much anymore. And, you know, spending less is the same as making more, you know? Absolutely. It's the same net result. So, um, but yeah, I, I think collectors shouldn't be afraid to part with things. Um, you know, there's a difference between collecting and hoarding. Absolutely. And, and, and that difference is curation. So don't be afraid to trim the fat, cut back on things that you know you're not going to enjoy. And, you know, like you said, you get the money out of it, you get time out of it, you get space. It's a win, win, win. And someone else, if you want to look at it this way, someone else gets a story that they're really going to love. And so. I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Uh, let's see here. Now, uh, we sort of talked about this. If you had any other hobbies or creative activities that you practice other than comic book collecting and, of course, YouTube, and you mentioned music? Yeah. So um, when I was in college, uh, I have a, my, right now my hobby is watching my daughter. <laughs> but no, <Yeah. laughs> when I was in college, um, I did beat making a lot. And I don't know. I forgot, <laughs> this is a mistake in the in my room tour video, but um, Yola Kim suggested that I add music to a video. And I was like, all right, cool, I'll add some music. And then I was like, oh, I don't wanna use like the stock music or, and I don't wanna like have copyright issues. Then I was like, oh wait, I used to make music all the time. I have all these beats on my computer. <laughs> and so um, in my room tour video, if you turn up the volume really high, <laughs> you can hear some of my beats in the background. Um, because I, but yeah, I turned it down while I was doing the voiceover yeah. and I forgot to turn it back up for the final video. Oh. But um, yeah, so if you're just listening like on your phone or something, you chances are you won't even hear the beats, but they're there. Um, I will, I do eventually want to get back into making music. Um, 
for a long time, it was just something fun to do. Like I, I made sample based music. So, you know, finding a song, finding a really cool, interesting part of that song and then making something new out of it. Um, it was just a fun exercise in creativity. Um, but I did music well before I ever had a camera or anything like that. Um, since then, you know, I've, I've developed a love for photography. Um, I was a graphic designer since I was 15. Um, oh. And so, you know, all of those different skills kind of serve me well now. I think video is probably like the ultimate combination of all of these different fields, whether it's audio, um, you know, cinematography is really just moving photography. Yeah. yeah. And so if you can see, you know, if you have an eye for still shots, you probably have an eye for video as well. Um, and then like being able, so. what'd you say? I, I would like to think so. Yeah, I, 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 it definitely helps. Like, I think some of the best films, like um, 12 Years a Slave, subject matter aside, is one of the most beautiful films that I have ever seen. It was like the entire time I was in that theater, I felt like every time I looked at the screen, it could have been a still photo that I would hang on my wall, right? And so it's like, I really enjoy video for that aspect of it. It's like, you know, we can, you can, we can make something really beautiful that sounds really good, that tells a good story. Um, and so, yeah, so video and filmmaking, if I, if I had gotten into some of this stuff a little bit sooner, I probably would have ended up being like a filmmaker. Um, but with YouTube, I can just be like a little miniature filmmaker and I can make whatever I want. And so it's, it's fun in that way. So yeah, uh, my hobbies, music production, um, I draw a little bit. Um, so I've got like one of my drawers here under my desk is specifically for art supplies. Um, we do like cover swaps inside my Facebook group. And so nice. um, I actually did a live stream in my group the other day. I was drawing uh, static. Uh, to send out to someone. Um, so, I mean, I'm not like a great artist by any means. It's just something that I kind of fell in love with all over again through my daughter. And so now it's something that I practice in order to get better. Yeah. So it sounds to me that you've always had in one way or another form of it, creating an aesthetic mind to yeah. just get something out of yourself. I mean, music the videos, photography, it, it all speaks in one way or another. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would I would certainly consider myself a creative. And that's part also why I noticed you in this comic book community out of thousands of thousands of waves of people. Mm. Well, thanks. And man. yeah, and just like we like the title said with finding fandom and everything yes and this is the only original question i really have is okay. what makes you a comic book fan how would you describe your fandom um first i love great art um i love great art and i love having fun so reading comics really reminds me of my childhood in a lot of ways because a lot of the stuff that I read um, are things that were adapted into animated shows, whether it's, I'm, I'm looking at you know, a print of the Ninja Turtles right above my desk. And that was like the first cartoon I remember watching ever. Um, and so I had the Ninja Turtles um, that moved on to Batman, the animated series, and that kind of led to the Justice League and all those other things. Um, so with comics, I love that the art is right there in your face. Like that's my favorite part of the comics. Um, and it's like kind of endless imagination, right? With a film, you're limited by, you know, the quality of the acting or the vision of the director or the budget for special effects. But with comics, you know, in its pure form, you're really just limited by the imagination and the skill of the artist. Um, but anything you have in your brain can end up on a page. And I really love that about it. Um, but beyond that, beyond the comics themselves, I've really fallen in love with the comic community in a big way. Um, when my daughter was born in March, like uh, I had, I had just hit a thousand subscribers on YouTube. Um, I had a Facebook group that had just hit like a hundred members or something like that. And 
um, my wife went into labor and I posted a message in the group like, hey guys, um, just send some prayers up. My wife's in early labor. This wasn't supposed to happen, whatever. Um, and then my daughter was born that next day. And the community just kind of came around me. They, they sent us DoorDash um, gift cards so that we could buy, have food delivered to the hospital. And yeah. um, my local shop, they had like a donation center for, for our family. Oh my God. Um, just the, the, because of the way the community embraced us, um, I just have such fond memories when I look at comics. It doesn't just remind me of, you know, my childhood, but it reminds me of like, great things about my adulthood as well and so um yeah i just i love comics i love the the other people who love comics i love the creators getting to meet them and, and talk to them when i do um and i just love it's really it's really a lot that i love about it but it's just i love like the feeling of warmth there's a lot of there is negativity that you can find in the comic industry and among comics commenters or creators or whatever but for me it's just about sharing things that i love with people who i think may also love it um and so at this point youtube is almost a separate um it, i get a different rush from youtube and sharing comics with people than i do from actually reading the comics but i love it all yeah and if i were to take out just one word out of how you described your fandom now i would say it's love yeah yeah absolutely that's great and one last question before we end this video where can people find you Sure. So um, I'm on all social media, or Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, just at BJ Kicks. Uh, my YouTube channel is BJ Kicks. So you can just type me in the search bar. I'm sure I'll come up at this point. Um, but if not, it's just youtube.com slash BJ Kicks. Um, and then I have a Facebook group called The K Squad. Um, the easiest way to find the Facebook group is just to go to any of my videos and click in the description um, because search typing group names and facebook searches is like the worst thing for whatever. i'll make sure to leave links down below for all of that if i can i appreciate it of course so thank you so much bj for being here with me and just trying to find fandom i guess and talk about comic books and our moving experience and whatnot and i would happily do this again sometime there's so much more to talk about just as there is so much content out there. Yes, absolutely. No, thanks for having me, man. I'm really, I was really excited to do this. Thanks for putting up with the technical issues and uh, <laughs> the baby sounds and stuff. I really appreciate it. In the end, everything was worth it and no problem at all, in my opinion. Thank you for doing this and thank you for all of you that has been watching this video. Hope I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Peace.